they are failing miserable, miserably at what he wanted them to do. And he says he's going to raise up new leaders who will guide his people according to his plan. Whoa, hallelujah. And it, it, just what I told you, if he has to go to another generation, he will do it. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to begin with this where only twice is this name mentioned. And we're going to begin and read from Jeremiah 23, starting with verse 4 through 6. And the Lord says, I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer. Does that not line up with what we just said earlier? What does righteousness do? Gets rid of fear. Yes. Amen. Righteousness doesn't make you afraid. Righteousness brings you to God. Nor be terrified. Oh, nor will any be missing. <laughs> declares the Lord. Behold the days are coming. Declares the Lord. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our Tescanu, Jehovah Tescanu. I told you that he only mentioned his name twice. And I'll tell you why. Because it says the days are coming. He could not be the Lord Tescanu. He could give them the, his standard. He could give them their ordinances and their laws and their way of doing things. But he could not be the Lord, their test canoe, until after the cross. And I believe that's why he only declared his name twice. And it was a prophecy that the days were coming. And you know what days that are? The days you and I are living in. Amen. You and I can call upon this name when they couldn't. What a day to be. Even the disciples could not call upon this name. Wow. Amen. Glory to God. So by identifying himself this way, God proclaims his righteousness is the standard to look at in the midst of the culture's chaos. Amen. His righteousness. We live in the time of chaos. Where everyone wants to decide and give their own interpretations of what is right and wrong. We're living in a time when authority are trying to change our culture. Rewrite history. Redefine what a man and a woman is. And the list is just endless. What's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But God's standard is all that is acceptable. His word is the standard, okay? And should never be compromised. He sets the bar of what's right and wrong. Amen? Amen? And his word has the ability to distinguish between good and evil. Hallelujah. We need shepherds who in our time will preach, preach God's word with uncompromising truth. Not what feels good. Not what is socially acceptable, society acceptable, but what does God's word say about it? 
But too many people in this time are calling evil good and good evil. Or we're saying, well, what's it matter? Everyone's doing it. That's a good sign. You better head the other direction. Okay. So righteousness comes from God. And so he is the only one that can define it because he is righteousness. Amen. Let me say, living a life of righteousness may not always feel good at the moment. Okay? Yeah, God, come on. Ease up a little bit. In fact, as you determine to go after righteousness, you may all of a sudden become aware of your sinfulness. And that won't feel good. I love, don't like, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I don't like it when it comes, some way it comes sometimes. And I may go, oh, back at you if you're the one trying to bring that word. Pastor knows too much about that. But in the long run, if you speak truth to our hearts, then we can yield, be willing to be submissive and good and say, yeah, I see that. I see that. So it may begin to feel Uncomfortable. That's a good sign. Say, that's a good sign. That's a good sign if you're uncomfortable under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he's bringing correction to your heart. He's brought a conviction and he says, deal with it. But you know what's good about Father God? He doesn't expect you to do that alone. He's already provided a way of escape for whatever situation you are in. Amen. So righteousness exposes areas where sin may have infected our lives. And Holy Spirit allows this so we can deal with the problem and run to, run to Jehovah Tescanu, the Lord our righteousness. So what does righteousness mean? It is the ability to stand in the presence of the Father with no sense of guilt, shame, fear, or inferiority. Amen? None of that. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve lost the moment they disobeyed God. I want us to go to Genesis 3, and I'm going to start with verse 9. You know the story well. We're going to read just a little bit of part of this. Genesis 3, starting with verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. What does righteousness do for us? You shall be far from fear. So the moment they disobeyed, I heard your voice in the garden, which was always what he longed to hear. Prior to that, he, he longed to hear the voice of God. He longed to walk in the garden with God. But the moment this happened, he wanted to run away from God. I was afraid because I was naked. I'm exposed before you, God. And he always was prior to that. And I hid myself. And God said, who told you? You know, it doesn't take very long for us to tell on ourselves. If you just listen to kids, they'll tell on themselves before you even know a lot of times what they've done. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then 
The man said, the woman <laughs> whom you gave to me, she gave it to me and ate. In four words, Adam has shifted the blame to woman and to God. And I want to tell you something. I would not be married to a man like Adam. Man should protect. He should have come to this. He shifted the blame and would not take responsibility. I want to say something, give this to you out here. I'm going to throw this out. Ad, Eve took of the eight first. But it was not until Adam, who had the leadership and took of it, that the sin came in. If he had stood his ground and not listened to the voice of the woman, I believe, and I'm just shielding this out to you, things would have been different. Because the blood line comes from man. And the minute this happened, the blood of Adam changed DNA. Sin came through to the bloodline. And from that moment on, everything shifted in man. Amen? Amen? Why do you think that when God was getting ready to take Israel out of Egypt, he told them to put what over the doorpost? The blood. Why not a cross? Why not a name? This house is the believers. These are Christians. Move on by. Because life is in the blood. And the blood DNA comes from the man. He, man had a grave responsibility in this. And for this, for Adam to shift the blame, it should... Until he ate of it, the sin was not complete. Amen? So, we see here when sin is present in our lives, we immediately have a sense of what? Condemnation, guilt, shame. Fear, which are all products of a sin consciousness. Which causes us to run from God, who is our righteousness, and only He can deal with this problem. And that's exactly what God did. Amen. Man could not save himself out of this situation. God, it was a sin problem that was God's now. Have you ever had your child do something and your child could not take care of that situation and it became your problem and only you now could redeem the situation? That's what God did. Yes, you have, Mom. Don't shake your head. The sin problem became Father God's problem. Though man was the one that committed, it was God. And God dealt with the sin problem through his son. Amen. Hallelujah. He put away sin by the sacrifice of his son. He made it possible on legal grounds. Do you know that heaven has legal grounds in a courtroom? And it all must be justified there first before it affects the world. So on legal grounds for you and I who are spiritually dead 
to, and are in now in union with Satan to become a new creation by receiving the very nature and life of God. Hallelujah. And this new life, the nature of God is called righteousness. Not based on what we can do. And not based on how much good or bad. It all comes down to nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can cleanse that blood of the sin nature. The DNA that's in it. And I actually, in one of my readings, I shared this with Kyle last Wednesday. In, I don't even know what book it's in, but I just jumped out of because I agree with it. It said, this scientist says, you show me the blood of a believer, of a person. He said, you can show me the blood of a person, and I can tell you whether he's a Christian or not. Because of the blood, it is different. I believe that. I believe the instant. And we're going to go a little bit further in this. But your DNA changes. You get his DNA. His blood washes out through our blood. Life is in the blood. So something had to be done through the blood of Jesus. You know, we need to make much more ado and sing many more songs about the blood. Because Satan definitely does not like to hear the blood. And you go through your house and you just say, I speak the blood. I speak the blood. And you're going to see even your atmosphere will change in your home. Hallelujah. Because there is power in the blood. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> a redemption. I want to say this and I want you to pay attention to this. A redemption that does not make man righteous is useless. Amen? Amen? It's useless. Until man is righteous and knows it. Yeah. And knows it. Satan reigns over him. Sin and disease are his masters. But the instant that man knows he is the righteousness of God in Christ and knows what that righteousness means, Satan is defeated. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Think about it. Just think about Jesus. Think about the fearlessness of our Savior Jesus. In the presence of the Father, and when he stood even before Satan himself, he was fearless. Fearless. Amen? Righteousness gets, destroys fear. He knew he had legal right in the Father's presence. He was the Son of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He knew he was the master over Satan and all the forces of hell. He was fearless during the storm, and he was able to speak with absolute authority. You understand righteousness, and you will stand with a voice of authority. Amen. 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 Even in the presence of... Of a large number of doubting people. Jesus was not afraid to say to a dead man. Lazarus come forth. <laughs> Amen. Amen? Yeah. And he had no sense of inferiority to death, hell, grave, or the grave. Wow. He was not afraid to speak to the blind. He was not afraid to speak to the deaf. He was not afraid to speak to the lame. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He was not afraid to say, be whole. Righteousness consciousness is the answer. And is, makes you the master over all of Satan's devices. Hallelujah. 
So what do we need? I tell you what, we need to preach on righteousness. Let's go into a deep study of righteousness. Wrap our minds around righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. All the other names are stacked upon this name. And in the armor of God, righteousness is our breastplate. What can guard your heart from all this other stuff? Righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. David cried out, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. What did he need? What was he calling out for? If righteousness was in his heart, everything else was going to work out. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You getting this? So how do we attain this righteousness that will give us perfect fellowship with the Father, that will give us a consciousness of being masters over the forces of darkness? When we accept and we know and we understand this one scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I believe this was the beginning of a scripture that turned Messiah ministry around years ago. When we got hold of spirit, soul, and mind, and spirit, soul, and body, but when this scripture, the great exchange, clicked in our minds, things shifted. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin. He who knew no sin. God made to be sin on our behalf that we might become what? The righteousness of of God in Christ. For he made him who knew no sin to be what? Sin. What a horrible, horrible thing. No wonder. Do you know that every, you, you can think of the most awfulest sin, most disgusting, and a lot of it's going on. That just turns yours and my stomach. Some we would, couldn't even begin to speak of. It was put on Amen. Jesus. Amen. Every one of them. Past, present, and future. A man, God's son, who knew no sin. Did not have that blood in that DNA in him. He knew no sin. Made him sin. And not only did he do that, he who knew no sickness or disease couldn't live in his body because of the righteousness in his blood. Every hideous sickness and disease was put on him. He made him sickness and disease who knew no sickness and disease. You've got to get a hold of this great exchange of what Jesus became and what you became in the great substitute and exchange. He got your filthy thinking, stinky thinking, <laughs> corrupt mind, corrupt sin. He got that and you got his. Amen. Glory. <laughs> He got your crippled sickness and disease, your pain, everything that happens to your body, and you got his. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He became you, and you became him in your spirit. Hallelujah. He who knew no sin... God made to be sin on your behalf, on my behalf, on the behalf that we would have the incredible great exchange 
of becoming the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Hallelujah. We should just lift our hands and rejoice over that. And you know who understands this probably more than to the church even? Satan. He knows it. And he tries to keep us from accepting the truth, walking in the truth, acknowledging the truth. We want to think that nothing ha happened. But let me tell you, the moment as quickly, as quickly, as quickly, as quickly that Adam partook of the apple and sin came into him, it happened that quick. The, my finger don't snap. Uh, that's why I yelled a lot at my kids, because my fingers don't snap. <laughs> I had to get loud. I raised my eyebrows. My kids always said, don't raise your eyebrows to us, Mom. <laughs> but that instant, do you realize things shifted for mankind the minute? <clears throat> but let me tell you a bigger thing. The minute you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you acknowledge that he became sin for you, that instant everything shifts and you are recreated. You are reborn. You become a new creation in an instant. Now, you become a new tree. But it takes a while for the fruit to be seen on that tree. But don't get impatient with yourself. If you do, you have to be impatient with me because I'm still striving in the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? But when we know that Jesus died for our sins as our substitute, and in the great courts of the heaven, that in, as Jesus sat down at the Father's right hand, he had already went to the mercy seat of God and placed his blood there. Pure blood. And when your and my accuser comes and tries to make accusations towards us, Jesus just points them to the blood. It says the, the, blood, the atonement of the blood is for the soul. Where are our struggles? In the soulish area. The blood is the atonement for the soul. So when Jesus died as our substitute, that on the third day, hallelujah, oh, drum rolls in hell going on. They think they've got him. They think they have done everything they can possibly. I mean, he don't even look like Jesus anymore in hell, okay? And they think they are, I can, in years of my imagination, can you just see the, uh, the celebrations going on. We got him. We got him. They're dancing around him. They're rejoicing in hell. And all the time, everything, I tell you what, on the third day, God finally says, come on up, Jesus. Amen. And there was not one demon in hell that could stop him. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I bet they were grabbing him, trying to grab him. And he just walked straight out of there. Went and picked up all our brothers and sisters over in paradise. And I tell you, I, it's just incredible. What happened between the cross and the throne room of God is an incredible journey. We need to go down there. So he arose from the dead after he put away sin, sickness, disease, poverty, everything that was stolen from us, put it in the pits of hell, and came forth victoriously. I don't believe he carried back sickness and disease upon his body. I don't believe he came back with sin on his body either. He came back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And when we take him as our Savior and we confess him as our Lord, that is the moment everything changes in our nature. And we become... The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you know why Virgil always says he's so wonderful? He's not talking about himself. He's bragging on who lives in him. 
You aren't, are you, brother? You're bragging on the Lord. I love it when he does that. I am magnificent. I'm just wonderful because he recognizes. And when he's doing that, he's acknowledging the one who lives on the inside of him. Wouldn't hurt for all of us to get as crazy as Virgil, okay? So when we know that we are what God says we are, masters, conquerors, and even more, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When we know that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things, what old things? That old nature, that old bloodline passed away and behold, all things have become new. And what a journey then begins. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you six things that righteousness was restored to man. Before I get into my sermon. I really haven't got to my scripture. <laughs> so, number one, very most important thing that was restored to us. Our right standing with God. Our right standing with God. Righteousness comes to us in the new creation and restores our standing with God the Father. Listen to me. On the same grounds that Jesus enjoyed in his time on earth. Amen. As he is, so are we. Righteousness restores to man his fellowship. Not just with God, but with each other. Because let me say, righteousness between God and the Father, its purpose is to cause there to be also good fellowship with mankind. Uh, and that makes the cross. Fellowship between God and fellowship with man. Jesus referred to God as what? Father. Father. And he enjoyed his father-son relationship with no sense of guilt, no sense of sin, no sense of condemnation whatsoever in his spirit. 1 John 1, 3. That which we have heard. Man, after the, the disciples got this, this is, uh, this is something they said. That which we have seen, because it all began to make sense when they received their salvation. Up to then, they couldn't even already understand Jesus in his mission. Okay? That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some just want to be Christians and not fellowship. It goes hand in hand. Amen. Righteousness restores to man his lost faith. Jesus believed in the Father. He believed in himself. And he believed in his mission. He knew whatsoever he asked he would receive. On John 5, 1 John 5, 14. This is the what? Confidence. Your salvation needs to bring you confidence. This is the confidence we have, not in ourselves, in him, that if we ask, what? If we ask, what's the next word? Anything according to his will. He hears us. Hallelujah. Righteousness restores our peace with God. Isaiah 57, 20 through 21 says, But the wicked, I'll give him just a moment. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. 
There is no peace, says my God, to the wicked. And Pastor made reference to this that earlier that God's, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. What's going to sustain you through everything? His peace. Having the peace of God. Righteousness restores freedom. The greatest freedom is not political freedom. Or freedom from financial worries. Or physical discomfort. But freedom from sin consciousness. Sin consciousness. The kind of freedom that Jesus had. Freedom from the fear of Satan. Freedom from the fear of man. Because he now trusts in God with all of his heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. And I am going to go back up to that. Okay, I'll just read it from there. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Now... Not with the what? Blood. blood. We're going back to the blood. Righteousness deals with the blood. Okay? Not with the blood of goats and calves. And that's all they had to use. And all that it could do was cover sin. But with his what? Oh, blood. Oh, blood. His own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all. Didn't have to go every year like they always did. Once for all. Having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, it's not enough. Ooh, say this with me. How much more shall, how much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleansed, what's going to take place when you accept the blood? What's going to take place? You know, I don't think about the sin. See, your consciousness, oh, I'm so afraid I'm going to sin. I'm so afraid I'm going to sin. You ain't got it yet, okay? Because the very first thing, you're, do I sin? Once in a while, yeah, okay. Yes, but I'm not constantly worried about it. I am not have my thoughts on it. I'm not afraid of it, and neither are you. Without spot to God, cleansed your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more? Hallelujah. Glory to God. What can wash my sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other but I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your righteousness is, it costs the blood of Jesus. Your righteousness is the most valuable possession you can behold. Hallelujah. Your righteousness. It is the, you got his righteousness. Value it. Take care of it. Honor it. Respect it. Walk in it. It is his righteousness that was put in you. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, where am I now in these notes? <laughs> Glory. John 8, 36 says, If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. 
Number six, righteousness restores your sonship. We are the sons and daughters of God. Romans 8, 36. I believe we have this witness. The spirit, and I know because I've been speaking about it. The spirit bears witness with our spirit. Let me see. Romans 8, 16. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to go to 17. The spirit bears witness. Do you have that witness? Do you have that witness? You're supposed to. You shouldn't be doubting your salvation. The Spirit, the Spirit, listen to me, live stream. You should have this witness as a child of the Most High God. It's not something I'm, I'm not boasting anything in myself. I'm boasting in the Lord. It's not something that I take lightly or neither should you. But you should have this witness and be able to talk very freely and openly about it. The Spirit it himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, we are, we are children of the Most High God. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. I changed father and got a new bloodline. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And not only that, then heirs. I inherit everything that Jesus has. I'm an heir. I'm an heir of God. And I'm joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Woo! There is no lack to the child of God. No. No good thing does he withhold from them who walk uprightly. What does that mean? Walk in righteousness. We're not servants. And we are not sinners. Righteousness has been restored to us. The most unspeakable speakable joy of fellowship. Amen. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. All oh, the half has never yet been told. Ooh, I don't know why those old songs are coming up within me. There's not in my notes, but it's okay. As long as I sing them in tune, I guess. <laughs> Glory to God. Now here comes my text. We're going to go to, you're going to see the demonstration of this. And this is what Holy Spirit actually woke me up to after I had the message lined out and wanted to share this with you. We're going to go to John 8. I'm going to start with verse 1. Hallelujah. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisee brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said unto him master this woman was taken in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what sayest thou this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. Who do we have that wants to constantly bring accusations? The accuser of the brethren is, in, is on the scene here. Amen. But Jesus stooped down 
and with his finger he wrote on the ground. So he didn't even hear them. He heard them not. Was enough. So when they continued asking him, they continued, What sayest thou? What sayest thou? What do you say about this, Jesus? He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, now listen to this, being convicted by their own consciousness. Why? Because they didn't have righteousness. And they are the leaders of the church. They are scribes and Pharisees. They are the leaders of the church. And being convicted by their own consciousness. What does righteousness give you? A clean consciousness. And let me tell you something about a righteousness spirit. It doesn't expose sin in somebody else. It chooses to cover. It's what love does. Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thou accusers? Has no man contend thee? She said, No man. Lord. What name did she? I wish that our Bibles were Hebrew Bibles. Because you would see when she said, Lord. Jehovah Siskanu, The Lord my righteousness. When the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment, what name did she pull from? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. She pulled from that name. This woman pulled. She had no righteousness in her own to stand in. The Lord my righteousness and Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit broke me up about this scripture, I've been thinking about it. But I noticed in this, and what he brought to my attention, this woman's name is not mentioned. She's called Woman. Why did he not call her by her name? Does God not know each of our name? And how special when he said to her, if whoever it was, whoever that, why did he not call her by name? Woman. And that's all she's referred to. I don't believe it's not to draw attention to. I believe the Holy Spirit's saying there's significance here. Satan hates woman. Because of Genesis 3. Here's what he was trying to happen. Go back to Genesis 3. believe it's 15. And this woman here represents... All of us, because all of us come through, have life because of woman. She's representing mankind, not just herself at this point. Woman, woman, woman. And in Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put what? Enmity between you, Satan, and the 
woman. And what was what were these leaders of the church trying to do? Bring accusation against the woman. Satan hates the woman because of this scripture, because he knew that something is going to come through woman. And what is it? And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Let me tell you, women of God, God has a calling through women. And Satan continually tries to destroy the woman's image. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he did not call her by her name. Oh, how. Because she's representing us. All of mankind. And as Isaiah 61 10. It says, he has clothed me with garments of salvation. I'm going to, he has, Isaiah 61, 10. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. He has, and at that moment that Jesus spoke to her, Neither do I condemn you. He just covered her with the garments of salvation and lifted her up in the most humiliating, shameful, disgusting situation. Can you imagine what she went through? Pulled and drug out into the city, the the streets, and all was, everyone was seeing this going on. But oh, when Jesus reached down and when he said to her, he just put that garment of salvation over her. She said, Lord. And he knew her greatest need at that moment. Righteousness. Righteousness. Neither do I condemn you. And he says that to all of us. John three sixteen, starting with verse 17. You know this one well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son. Oh, get out of that. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, might receive of his righteousness. He is our Jehovah Siskinu, the Lord my righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. First, my last scripture, 1 Corinthians 1 30. By his doing, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us. And here's another exchange wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption we get everything he became every one of those for us we lack no good or beneficial thing you know in one of the scriptures i gave you i believe it's in hebrews it, uh, we were going on that it says that without spot Without spot, I used to, in his, without spot in his blood, uh, he became, his blood was spotless. I used to think years ago, when we'd read that scripture or somebody would quote it to us, that Jesus is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I think, boy, that's going to be a big one. 
I thought, he ain't coming anytime soon because there's a lot of sin in the camp without spot or wrinkle. And I could just, I just elbowed Dennis there, a good one, you know, on that one. You can always point to somebody else's sin, amen. So I thought, he ain't coming anytime soon because I could not comprehend it. But his blood is without spot. And when you and I stand in his righteousness, and he becomes our righteousness, with, we are without spot or wrinkle in the spirit man. What Jesus sees, what the Father sees, and absolutely what Satan fears, is when a child of God knows the righteousness of God, that he is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He becomes the master over all of Satan's devices. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Is, are you going to... There we go. That was fabulous. Good job. That was Holy Spirit revealed. I just really felt like I need to add just one thing to that. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. I was saved for years and years and years. Now there was two things that I really had a problem with. Number one, I was unworthy. And I heard everybody saying that. The reason I felt unworthy is because my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions weren't renewed. So I felt unworthy. I didn't understand righteousness and how to forgive myself. Didn't understand that. But the Holy Spirit revealed them both. And look at John chapter 16, verse 8. Remember where Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I leave? Because you couldn't understand righteousness. You could not understand it, not being born again. But after you're born again, the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. And I'm not going to go into it, but you remember the story about how Jesus revealed himself. When I was saying I was unworthy, he told me that I was degrading the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he said, you're worthy of everything in heaven, not because of what you've done, because of what I did. So the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit, if I'm coming short in this, reveal it to me so I can be strong. That was absolutely awesome. Man, good job. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kyle, and then I'll make some announcements. When I was in Vietnam, and I hadn't received my healing yet, but he's already healed me, okay? But anyway, a cannon went off behind me, and a compression of it, boom, this side of my head. And I don't hear out of this ear nearly as good as I do the other one. So that's why I... Excuses, excuses, excuses. Oh, my goodness, the excuses. <laughs> Uh, if you have a tie, if you need a tied envelope, raise your hand and Linda will bring it to you. And then, of course, if you want to give over the internet, just go to mmcokc.com and follow.